Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. And people's very roles become commodities. If you look at a simple thing like a helicopter pilot, which is a highly skilled, highly paid role, things like drones are putting helicopter pilots out of business. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. I appreciate your time and appreciate your attention tuning in. On today's show, we have Tony Hughes, and we're talking about strategic social selling and the overall overarching topic of the show is essentially why you need to evolve to keep your sales job. It's an important topic, of course, and Tony gets quite deep into it. You can find out more about Tony over at rsvpselling.com. His book, The Joshua Principle, is available on Amazon. And with all that said, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, Tony, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Hey, Will, it's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome. I'm glad to have you on. And I want to talk about social selling or strategic social selling as you uh, as you brand it but before that and to tee up the conversation perhaps i want to i want to ask you about a, something that you quote on your website and i've seen it elsewhere and it clearly it's come from a study i think it's a forest report but do you really like genuinely believe regardless of what reports are out there that a third of b2b uh, sales professionals are going to lose their jobs over the next five years or so. And it, we'll, we'll stick on this for a second, but this will tee up the rest of the show. So I know that sounds like a sensationalist claim, um, but I really do. And the reason I do is that everything over time becomes commoditized. The products and services that people are selling become commodities and people's very roles become commodities. If you look at a simple thing like a helicopter pilot, which is a highly skilled, highly paid role, Things like drones are putting helicopter pilots out of business. The role of being a flight engineer on an international airliner has all but disappeared. I think it's the A380 is the only aircraft left now that has that third seat role inside the cockpit. So I'm not alone. People like Andy Hoare from Forrester predict that about 22% of roles in B2B selling will disappear within the next four years. But I don't think we need to be terrified of artificial intelligence, algorithms, social technology. Um, the web, the, the reality is the salespeople who embrace technology, all forms of it, to become much more efficient and use it to create leverage to start to expand the reach of their network and build trust with people in advance of meeting. Those people are assured of having strong futures in professional selling, but the people who wrongly and naively believe that their value is in the relationship that they have with someone are in for a really rude shock because I don't think customers and prospective customers are bored and lonely and looking for people to have coffees and lunch and meetings with. They're all busy. You need to provide value for them, help solve their problems, help them realize their opportunities, or you don't have a reason to really be there and have a seat at the table. So, and just to clarify this thing, because I agree with everything you're saying, and I find I find the whole topic fascinating. Are you saying that there will be a third less B2B sales jobs, or that a third of people will be out of those jobs, perhaps replaced by other people, because they will just be made redundant because they haven't moved forward? Well, the types of roles will change. So I remember when I first got into the business world a long time ago now, but my first job was in banking. Um, banks still employ lots and lots of people, but the types of roles they have are very, very different. They've moved people away from the back office, out behind counters to be out engaging with clients. And that's true of every business. Um, I personally believe that the, the focus on CRM is really moving away now to customer experience. So we need to be thinking about how we can create great customer experience for people. And that often in, in, involves simplification, automating as much as we can, thinking about how the client wants to engage with us. And increasingly, I believe that that will mean, will mean fewer field salespeople especially. So field, field sales roles, I think, are under real threat. Um, you know, you've got to be truly strategic in how you operate as a field seller to really justify the high cost of the role. So uh, inside sales that's outbound, uh, bringing sales and marketing Together, I believe that marketing managers or marketing directors need to be given sales quotas because they've got to figure out how to transact commodities far more effectively. So it's not that all roles will disappear. A lot of them will morph into lower value roles. So the older people in sales that are expensive need to learn to embrace technology if they want to stay relevant and protect their career. Just one more on this before we dive into the idea of personal branding and, and social selling. If more roles are going to become 
uh, commoditized, they're going to become less valuable, clearly. You might cut commissions from them, whatever happens. Are there going to be any new roles that are going to come about for people that are willing to push themselves and, and learn new things and, and break barriers? Uh, what new roles are going to evolve out of all of this? Well, the toughest role in selling, I believe, is is working for some kind of startup or technology company where you're really pioneering a market segment where you're being an evangelist and educating people. Um, uh, I hope you excuse the metaphor, but you know the the reality is is that the reward for a pioneer is uh, is obvious is often a whole lot of arrows and they they perish. It's the settlers who come in later and actually prosper. So anyone who's in a startup that's wanting to change the way that customers think about the way they operate their businesses and solve their problems, they absolutely need salespeople that, that can go and have those conversations. But then as things become an accepted technology or an accepted process, then it becomes more of a commodity. The margins get smaller, the competition becomes greater, and then every business has got to figure out how do we drive cost out of the equation here. And you know, one one of the mantras I have when I work with my clients is is I say to them that the way that you sell, the way that you go to market, is far more important than what you're actually selling, because in the eyes of the buyer, when they ha- have a look at the competitive landscape, they'll go, do you know what? There's there's a handful of people here that can provide something for us that solves the problem, and in our in our eyes, you're all pretty much the same. You all come in and put up your analyst reports and make all your claims about being market leader and unique but you can all do the job for us so th- we need to differentiate in in the insights that we have and the way that we deliver for clients the way we manage their risk and salespeople need to elevate the conversation they need to learn how to talk the language of leaders which is delivering outcomes managing risk and delivering on the business case and salespeople that can have those kinds of co- conversations are going to do really well and people that just want to build a relationship and provide information are, are going to really struggle. And how do we develop the ability to have those conversations and that uh, expanded business acronym of rather than uh, here's my product, featured benefits, or the cliche yeah. sales stuff that we shouldn't have been doing five years ago, never mind now. How do we have those elevated C-suite conversations? Is it just experience and mentoring or are there any resources that we can look to? So I'm going to recommend a couple of books in the conversation today. Uh, there's a really good book called The Challenger Sale, uh, published by Corporate Executive Board. The two authors are Matt Dixon and Brent Adamson. The book's been out for about four years now, and they just released the follow-up to that book uh, late last year called The Challenger Customer. Um, but The Challenger Sale is really good because the, the the thing that it says is it's important to lead with a provocative insight it, it, You know, when you want to go and work with a client. It earns you the meeting. It earns you the conversation. I've worked with a lot of organizations that have had a go at implementing Challenger and and not all of them succeed. It really is quite difficult. But it's one of the things I focus on with clients is what's your provocative insight? And you can't do it in an arrogant way. It's a, it's a big ask to go and walk into a client and try and claim that you know more about them in their industry than they do. But you need a provocative insight that's going to earn you that conversation at the senior level because one of the big problems that salespeople have, especially for the ones that are going to lose their roles, one of the big problems they have is this law of selling, which is we all get delegated down to people that we sound like. So even if we can get that meeting, for example, with the chief financial officer in an organization, the moment we start talking about tech or the moment we talk about lower level issues, they'll think, oh, I'll, I'll get you to go and talk with this person in my organization. So we do want to get sponsored down to the organization <clears throat> to help our champion gain consensus because everyone needs to gain consensus these days in their buying decisions. Um, But we want to get delegated and still have access rather than get pushed away. Well, you've tied this up beautifully here, Tony, because I think there's a huge difference between coming up with a provocative insight when you are a, uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm diminishing the role here, but a salesperson versus if someone comes along and they are a industry expert and they come to you with some crazy insight, you're going to put more value naturally on that industry expert, which brings me very nicely onto this idea of personal branding uh, and the other steps that go along with that to have, I guess, the, the overall goal of all this is perhaps to have more impact when you have these messages, when you reach out and, and to drive engagement back to you and conversations, which then lead to natural sales rather than cold calls and, and weird, horrible slideshow uh, PowerPoint pitches. 
Now, yeah, we, and we all know there's a, <laughs> there's a special place in hell for people that use PowerPoint on prospects. Right? Definitely, definitely. So let's let's talk about this idea of personal branding because it's something that I'm not clear about from the sales perspective. From my perspective as a podcaster, talking about sales, clearly the bigger audience and the reach that I've got, the more engaged they are, it all adds up to more views, uh, bigger sponsorship deals, and it seems more linear yeah. and straightforward. For the salesperson, the B2B salesperson listening to this, I'm not I'm not 100% crystal clear on where they should be. Can you give us a little bit of an insight of what their audience should be, whether they should be going industry-wide, whether they should be keeping it super niche and specific, whether they should be yeah. trying to just go deep with the C-suites of their industry or whether they should be going you know, wider. And then we can talk about content, publishing, collaboration, and all that kind of stuff afterwards. Okay, so let me just say at the outset that although I use the term social selling, I, I do so because the rest of the world uses it as well. I guess it's just a, a common tag that, that means something. I actually don't like the term. I hate um, it. Because, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I really don't like the term, right? And and I've I've added the word strategic in front, which is even more meaningless, right? But so let me just, just say a couple of things here. The first is that people have always, for time and immemorial, they've always bought from those they know, like, and trust. And all business is done at the speed of trust. You, you can't unnaturally accelerate a transaction with somebody if you haven't earned the right uh, to ask them for the order and if you haven't built trust first. But the thing that's interesting today is that 75% uh, of buyers research the person that's going to be selling to them or, or meeting with them before they either choose to do so or before they see that person face to face. And that really begs the question, when someone finds us online, what is it that they see? Do they see some Porsche driving, quota crushing, Uber salesperson um, I've even seen one person's LinkedIn profile as a salesperson and they had the term elephant catcher un un under their name. And, and my view is, well, if you're a potential buyer and you research that person, I would cancel the meeting. I don't want to be someone's <laughs> prey. I don't want someone hunting me. I want mm. someone who can work with me and deliver me some value, help me deliver some outcomes, manage my risks, solve my problems. Um, and I want to be in control as the buyer. So, so the first thing is because buyers research us we need a strong personal brand that supports what we're doing now the reality for you and i will is we're both publishers and we're wanting to build big audience following and therefore what we do in social media is not at all necessarily what a salesperson would do what they're really wanting to do is they want to evidence their credibility they want to show insight and they want to start to set an agenda about the conversations that they want to have with the person that they're meeting with. And if they do that well, when they get to see the person face to face, they won't need to talk about themselves and try and earn the right to ask questions. That job will largely be done. So Neil, Neil Rackham, whom I know and I'm a huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of, and uh, his spin selling concepts are timeless and still valid today. But in Neil's research he did years ago back in the 80s, one of the things that they, they established was that the the top 10% of sales performers speak only one third as much as the bottom 90% um, uh, of performers. So if you talk less, you sell more. And um, if you have a really good, strong brand online, people will check you out. It'll make it easy for you to then make the meeting and the conversation all about the other person rather than talking about yourself. And I wanna get really practical with this for a second. Should B2B sales professionals, all things considered, be only and a hundred percent publishing on LinkedIn, or for their personal brands to grow, do they need to have an external blog or be looking on Twitter or elsewhere? Is LinkedIn the platform just for ease of conversation and to get all the audience bought in on this? Is LinkedIn where we should be looking at? So for B two B, the short answer is yes. The bigger answer is we should all go and be where our market is. So yeah. if we're in B2C, then obviously a, a platform like Facebook is important. But the reason uh, LinkedIn is so powerful is the first thing is it's free. And if you're in business-to-business -business selling, almost every single person that can help you be successful, customers, partners, advisors, everyone you need is an entrepreneur, business person, salesperson, sales manager, employer, everyone is in LinkedIn. So you need to go be where your market is. It's free. But my first piece of advice is stop using your LinkedIn profile as an online CV 
and start to use your LinkedIn in profile as a personal branding microsite. So think about what's my brand, what's my promise of value. And in your LinkedIn profile, you know, you, rather than your title, you want to have your promise of value in the in in that top line under your name and then in your summary you want to have a summary in there and in the summary don't talk about your work history talk about the value that you offer the 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 markets or the people that you serve and also talk about the values by which you operate because that starts that process of building trust and is this the value that your company gives or the value as you as an individual gives the prospect that's a really good question. Now, this is a little controversial. I, I say to all the people I work and I say it in front of their boss, I say LinkedIn is your piece of real estate. It is not your employers. It's not your companies. Do not ever start spamming, blasting, pushing, advertising, selling your company's products and services in your LinkedIn profile. This is your personal branding microsite. Talk about your insights, the values, the way that you operate. And as you move from employer to employer throughout your life, you shouldn't need to change what's in this part of your LinkedIn profile much at all. If they want to see who you work for right now, they can they can just scroll down in your LinkedIn profile to, to see who your current employer is. And if they want to understand about your employer's products, there's a link to go to your company's website where they can see about that. But LinkedIn is about you and your values. And I, I want to just dive into this a bit deeper because this is useful. How do you know what your values are if you're taking your company and the products perhaps out of the, the picture? And I agree with you on that 100%. How do you know what values you give? How do you know what values that your potential prospects want? And how do you tie this all together in a succinct message. Clearly, we could talk for days on this and there's, we go as deep as we like, but for anyone listening now who goes, oh crap, I need to update my LinkedIn profile, what what should they be looking to do with it you know, on real practical terms? So I, I'm gonna say something again, which might sound very bold, but in my last corporate role, because three years ago I left the corporate world and went out on my own doing this on the, on the back of a book I'd published, but my last role was was managing director for one of the world's largest customer relationship management software companies. And I was working with my own salespeople and our channel partners that we went to market with. And the thing I found, it's a very competitive market. There's over 100 CRM companies out there in the world. Um, but the thing that was happening is every time my people, and I would even catch myself making this mistake too, we'd go talk to a potential client and they would want to have a conversation about the features and functions of your product. Does it do this? Does it do that? Does it run in the cloud? Does it go on premise? All of these things. And the, the reality is those things the customer was focusing on have nothing to do with whether they are going to be successful or unsuccessful in their implementation. So I would use a circuit breaker. I would only say this if I was sure that they were committed to having a CRM. So I would anchor this conversation by making sure that they agreed that you have no chance of being truly customer centric. You have no chance of delivering great customer experience unless you have a CRM. But I would say, have you ever implement, implemented one previously yourself or is there anyone on your team who has? Because the reality is, is that 70% of CRM implementations fail. So what is it about the way you're approaching this that makes you think you're not going to be part of the 70%? Now, that would take people back, right? But what I would suggest to salespeople that work with me, I'd say, put that kind of information in your LinkedIn profile. You're now separating yourself from everybody out, everybody else out there. All of the others are saying, my product is all sunshine and light. It solves all of the world's problems. B buy from me, look at all the features and functions, look what analysts say about us. Whereas you're gonna be saying, I will help you as a client manage your risk and deliver your outcomes. I know what it takes to go implement these tough change management projects successfully so you're showing a value of i want to deliver the outcome for you i don't want to sell you a product i actually want to figure out whether you're a good fit for me because you'll damage my brand if you buy my product from me and you fail so i want to see whether you qualify to be a client for me now you don't say it that way because that's arrogant but that's how you need to feel so what i would suggest is figure out how to get that to come through in your linkedin profile now you stand out from the crowd so you're and this is slightly cliche at this point perhaps but you're essentially pitching yourself as the consultant rather than the salesperson. Yeah. Well, every salesperson needs to be a consultant. Yeah. If if you're not if you're not solving a problem for somebody and you can't solve their problem unless you understand what it is. So we need what I call a, a a hypothesis of value. We need to go to the client and not turn up and say, you know, tell me about yourself and what keeps you up at night. Now the first thing is they'll throw us out the door if they <laughs> if they 
they believe that we have not done our homework. So again, LinkedIn is important to do homework on the people that we're meeting. If you turn up and meet someone in business and say, oh, so how long have you been with the company and where were you before you started here? And that that just shows that you did no research. All of that information is in the person's LinkedIn profile. So I, I say, like, let the person know. Don't go into stealth mode in LinkedIn. Don't don't hide your profile settings. Let the person know that you looked at them, you did your research. That's all part of showing that you're professional and that you've done your homework before you actually meet with somebody. So every salesperson needs to be consultative in how they in, in, in how they operate. And I, I recently last year had our in-ground sw- swimming pool renovated and to my surprise there's a lot of different choices in how you can try and renovate a swimming pool and a simple thing like that the salesperson that i bought from was the one that took a very consultative approach um and he he did it very genuinely and he helped me make a good decision with with what i did and you as clearly expert in the sales field uh you know published author all this did you see him as a salesperson or did you see him as a consultant even though he was clearly a salesperson? He was clearly a salesperson. I engaged with him as a salesperson, but I did business with him because he adopted a consultative approach. Sure. Okay. And I, 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 I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Tony, but is there, is there a difference between the consultative salesperson and someone who is truly a consultant? Is there a difference between the way that they should go about work? Because the small amount of consulting work I've done is based around the premise of come in and tell us what's wrong, that's where the value is versus the salesperson is and f- fix it for me because I've not got the time or the energy or the resources. Is is there a difference? Because we talk about the consultative sales sale. Is there a difference between the two approaches when we dive deeper into it? There absolutely is. And one of the big differences is the consultative salesperson is wanting to lead to the value that they offer Whereas the true consultant is able to be far more flexible because the, you know what they're really offering is their ability to be a mirror for the person they wo- that they're working with and and enable change within that organisation. But for example, if you sell a customer relationship management software system uh, and what the customer really needs is marketing automation rather than CRM, then you, you know if you take a pure consultative view, it's not going to lead to prioritizing what you offer them. So it's not about manipulating anybody, but it's taking a consultative approach and asking questions that lead to the value that you can provide and have a hypothesis of value that starts to set the agenda around what the focus should be in the conversation. Interesting. Okay, next question I'm going to ask you is, <laughs> as controversial as what it gets on the Salesman podcast, in the sales industry, it's something that I'm asking a lot of people. I, I was I was unsure whether to ask you about it because it's a massive rabbit hole and we're constrained on time. On their LinkedIn profiles, should everyone listening be creating their own content, their own posts, or should they be building that network, adding uh, adding people, and focusing on the engagement and perhaps sharing other people's posts through status updates rather than uh, pulse and their own content should which which should which is which is the way forward right because it might change but in 2016 right now which is the best uh, way to go about it so the answer is they need to do all of it but they should not be writing posts and selling time now i've 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 written nearly 300 posts i've published in linkedin and built an audience following uh, i think as of today it's taken about 18 months but but well over 60,000 I'm publishing posts to attract an audience, a salesperson is not. So the posts that they need to write, they may only ever need to write three posts. And I'll just give an example of this. I've worked with people in the recruiting industry and a common objection that a recruiter will get when they're phoning a hiring manager to try and get a meeting is the hiring manager will say, look, if I had coffee and met with every recruiter that rang me, I'd never get any work done. You know, I get so many of you people calling me, you've either got a good candidate or not, send me a CV. So that's a common objection that they get. And I used to do it to recruiters. Mm -hmm. Now, the recruiter wants to go build a relationship because they know that people do business with those they know, like, and trust. They want to build a relationship, but the relationship is of no value to the buyer until they're already delivering for them. So what I say is, you should start to write some posts for two reasons. It's going to be the best sales training that you as a recruiter ever have, and it's going to help you create an authentic narrative that overcomes this objection. And if this person is one of the 75% that'll check you out before they meet, this will overcome the objection because I believe that great, great salespeople avoid objections rather than try and overcome them, right? So if you know that's a common objection that people have, what you need to lead with is, 
you, the hiring manager, need to invest 20 minutes with me so that I can save you 12 hours of your time and so that I can dramatically de-risk the highest risk part of your role, which is hiring the wrong person. And we can all hire people and I can put CVs in front of you on the basis of skills, qualifications and experience. That's easy. But the reason you have to fire people out of your team is that they're not a good cultural fit. And it doesn't matter what's on your company's website about vision, mission and culture. I need to know what your values are and your culture that you instill in your team. So if you'll invest 20 minutes with me so I can understand the culture, what culture fit means, I can screen out for that as a criteria, as well as the other obvious things. And I'll define value in the fewer number of CVs that I get you because I will respect your time. So if you give me 20 minutes, I'll save you 12 hours and I'll dr dramatically de-risk the process for you. When can we meet for 20 minutes? So you, you're proactively getting on the front foot about, about that objection. And what I say to them is, Write posts about that. Go and do your research. Find find out, you know, how often are people fired because of poor cultural fit? What if someone's in an IT project delivery role and they hire the wrong person in as a business administrator, sorry, as a business analyst or as a project manager, or as a, t a technical consultant, what's the cost to a project of a mishire? Because I know in sales, if you have a team of salespeople carrying $2 million numbers, and you hire the wrong person into this B2B enterprise selling kind of environment, you just cost yourself a million dollars of revenue if you hire the wrong person because they'll miss their number, you'll need to manage them out, you'll need to get another person on board, and on top of losing a million dollars of revenue, you're gonna damage your personal brand internally, and that person's gonna damage the company's brand with your clients. So there's a huge cost in hiring the wrong person. So if you feel passionate about it, you write some posts about it, now you have an authentic narrative that you can go and take. So they shouldn't be writing posts every day, but they should get two or three or four or five posts in there that, that adopt the opposite position, the positive opposite position of common objections that they get and also posts that show insight. So this person goes, wow, I'm not sure whether I'll meet with this person, but look at the insights that they show. This person's worth meeting with. So, so that's why you want to do it. And then as far as the cadence of regular sharing content, you do that through updates in LinkedIn, which will also push it out to Twitter. And you can use simple tools like Buffer is something that I recommend. There's a free version of that. So you can basically, if you're on any website and you find a great piece of content that your audience would care about, you just click the Buffer button. There's other tools that do content curation, but that'll push it out to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, it'll push it out to all of those kinds of platforms for you, even even Google Plus or as many social accounts as you've got. Um, and you can work with other people's content easily. And again, it staggers me that salespeople claim that they're in a profession and yet they don't stay current. They don't read, right? So buyers want to deal with professionals and professionals are staying current. So if you're sharing the latest interesting information, your market will end up saying, Do you know what? I'm too busy to go and source all of this stuff every day. But if I follow Mary... She seems to find all of this great con content that's relevant to me. And that's one of the reasons why salespeople should seek to specialize in either a vertical industry as far as the markets that they're prosecuting, or if it's a horizontal thing that they're doing, um, that they should become experts about that particular domain so they can share insight. And also in LinkedIn, this is the power of it, is as you find people that have great content for your audience or for your clients or potential clients, connect to them in LinkedIn. Let them know that you're sharing your content. And again, when people research you and click on you, they'll go, wow, people that looked at Tony Hughes have also looked at Neil Rackham. You know, they can see there's common connections. They go, wow, well, Tony Hughes must be credible if Neil Rackham has, you know, is connected to him and he's endorsed his book. So this power of association becomes really good. And when you finally get in front of somebody, it's this relaxed conversation where you can focus on, on the buyer rather than trying to push anything at them. Tony, you're on a roll there, so I didn't want to interrupt you, but you, you've you given the best answer to that question of any guest that's been on the show, and I appreciate that. And this, I've, I've never really even thought about it this way before, of this format of the posts that you produce are answering or essentially pre-qualifying leads that are going to check your profile is, is super useful because it's scalable, it's free other than your time, you're getting all the fringe uh, benefits coming in yeah. uh, and that they see you as an expert. So the conversation that you have is a is a more high level one just off the very bat. I, I, I really enjoy this because I think there is a, because everyone has an ego, of course. I think there is a pull to do a post of 
top five ways X, Y, Z in your industry, which doesn't really help anyone. It might be entertaining and it might get thousands of views, but it's not really adding anything. And it's taking up the time that you could have done a post which is going to be, have influence, which is going to affect your bottom line. And clearly, egos aside, that's what we're here to do. We're here to smash targets and make those commissions and you know, then live lives that we want to live off of the funding that that provides. And something else that's yeah. kind of, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but we might be leading towards it perhaps. Should we be aiming for inbound leads to come in from this content? Or is that for marketing? Is that nothing to do with us? Uh, or, or should we be trying to build, especially if we're going vertical within the industry, should we be trying yeah. to build a little ecosystem that travels with us from company to company? So I've, I've personally had lots of business come to me because of my activity in LinkedIn, but what I'm doing is not something I would expect a salesperson to go and do. So they, they, they may jag the odd lead, but, but this is not why they should do it. This, this is all about them using LinkedIn as a research tool and as a personal brand building tool and an, and an, uh, an agenda setting tool. Um, we need to stay away from the interrupt and push the blast and spam model of anything that we're doing. That's the, the way we modernize selling is to be a person of great values and value in what we offer people. So I don't personally believe a LinkedIn strategy is about creating inbound opportunities, although it can happen. Um, the, 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 the number one reason you do it is to have a personal branding microsite and support what you're going to do. And then you target your clients and you use LinkedIn as a re really good research platform. And I'm a big big advocate of Sales Navigator. I think all organizations uh, should buy Sales Navigator for their people. And one of the reasons an organization should buy Sales Navigator is that without Sales Navigator, if your people have just got their own individual LinkedIn accounts, they'll be connecting with as many of your potential clients as they can, and when they leave your organization, they'll take those first degree relationships with them. Mm. Whereas if you get sales navigator for people, when your people leave the organization, you turn that navigator license off and they're not taking those relationships with them. So sales, navigate, sales navigator lets you get exposure. Cause you know, there's the three degrees of connection inside LinkedIn on the paid versions. There's only two degrees of connection on free, but sales navigator gives you 25 fully cracked open searches of the entire LinkedIn database. There's 440 million members of LinkedIn uh, as, as we speak at the moment, but you can get those, those, those cracked wide open searches, but you can search and research as if people were first degree connections using sales navigator. And that, that, and that protects the company's intellectual property when people leave. And final one before I ask a couple of questions, I ask everyone that comes on the show, Tony, do you feel, or do you know, even perhaps that there's going to be any immediate changes with Microsoft acquiring LinkedIn? Is there anything in the next 12 months that's going to hit us or change on the platform? Yes, I got some views on this. So the first thing that is guaranteed to happen relatively early. So I, so the first thing is I believe Microsoft will leave LinkedIn alone for at least a year, uh, which would be a good thing. LinkedIn does not have a good track record with, with acquisitions. If you have a, a look at Nokia and Yammer, um, and, and even Skype for business, I've got some real question marks about what they've actually done there. I'm a, a big fan of Skype. Um, but the first thing is I think they'll leave it alone for a year. The, the next thing we'll see is we'll see an increase of advertising inside LinkedIn. They're, they're paying a lot of money, $26.2 billion, right? So $26,000 million they're paying. So they need to recoup that investment. Um, and I think we'll see increased advertising. That started about a year ago on LinkedIn anyway, but I think that's going to ramp up. I believe if LinkedIn's really smart, uh, sorry, if Microsoft is really smart, they they know that they bought the world's most powerful database. That's that's really what they purchased, the most the world's most powerful publishing platform. Although there's 440 million members of LinkedIn, there's about 1.2 million members actively post content, but it's a very powerful publishing platform. And and Microsoft is really all about the productivity of the business person and office worker. And LinkedIn is really about the productivity of the recruiter and salesperson and, and entrepreneur. So I think if Microsoft can bring LinkedIn in, into platforms like Skype, um, if they can enable people to collaborate with their, their own collaboration tools and bring those into the LinkedIn platform, it's going to be incredibly powerful. Um, but to me, the massive opportunity is to unlock 
the value of going beyond social selling, beyond CRM, and to really think about the the platform and enabler for incredible customer experience. So, you know, you even imagine if you had a potential client and you you know you send them a calendar request and then you organise a Skype meeting, for example. You know, but then you can click a button and you can see their LinkedIn profile and you can see all of that background. You can see their their face before they even come on camera. These really simple things can really transform the experience because people form a view within within a second of seeing someone's face and meeting them. So the more we can make those interactions more powerful and have relevance and context, it'll it'll be transformative. So they're paying a lot of money, um, but I think one plus one can equal three if they do this well. And what I'm really waiting to see is how are they going to improve the integration between the world's most powerful person database and human engagement platform for the business world? How, how are they going to integrate it with their own productivity tools, but make CRM far more effective for people? Interesting. Interesting. I feel like having pretty much zero knowledge on the whole thing, other than anecdotally from guests coming on the show, I feel like they could just make the ultimate CRM and cut everyone else out. I don't know how they, I don't know if they can do that, whether there's there's laws or legislation in place to kind of prevent it a little bit. But it seems like they could just cut everyone else out of uh, LinkedIn and they'd, they'd ha- again have that resource that no one else could leverage. And I think instantly they'd have one of, if not the world's most powerful CRM. I'm interested to see what happens. And with that, Tony, I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on the show. First one, who do you think is the world's greatest salesperson? Well, the greatest salesperson to me living at the moment um, is probably Elon Musk. Now, I know that sounds strange because he's not a very good sales guy, <laughs> but but he is passionate about his vision and mission to, to change the world at many levels. And he's been an evangelist. He's got, he's got people on board. I mean, the launch of the Tesla 3 recently – was the most successful launch of a motor vehicle in the history of the world. Um, they they took orders for, for $12,000 million worth of cars. So about 320,000 orders where people paid $1,000 US. Interestingly, not one salesperson involved in taking those orders. People just put the order on the website. But it was him up on stage just talking passionately um, as much as Elon Musk can um, about what he's doing. So he's, he's, he's very authentic. He's amazing. I read a post about him the other day and it, I kind of know a little bit about his story, but it unraveled it further in that uh, he was successful before he went to PayPal, made a load of money from PayPal. But while, while he was there, he decided he wanted to put a man on Mars. And I thought this all, I thought SpaceX came way after all this. So then, and then you look at what he's doing and he's, so he's, you know, founded SpaceX, founded Solar City, uh, which is a, a 100% solar uh kind of power generator for the grid in, in the yeah. states and elsewhere and now he's looking i don't know which way around it is either solar city is looking to buy tesla or tesla is looking to buy solar city and he's got sharing both so how that works i'm not sure again uh, legally but he's he's building a vehicle and the means to power it and spaceships which eventually yeah. will become solar powered i imagine so that when he lands on mars He's got all the technology to suck in energy from the sun, all the Tesla battery power to run some kind of space station on the surface of Mars. And it's just mind-blowing that one guy, clearly it's not one guy, he's got a big team behind him, I'm sure, and, and yeah. he's working with the right people. But it's just his vision and how all these pieces are coming together. I don't even think I could predict in 10 years' time what he's going to be doing uh, then. It's absolutely yeah. crazy to me. And... Um, I think, you know, looking back in 10, 20 years time, we're all going to be talking about him like, you know, like no one else at this age, I think. And, you know, I mentioned him to my dad and I'm saying, dad, he's doing all this. And my dad's kind of like, yeah, it's interesting, but, you know, doesn't really care. I think there'll be a point where he'll be so mainstream. He'll be, you know, beyond the Richard Branson's of things. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just obsessed with his story and I'm, I'm looking into it more and more. So I'm glad you said that. Uh, because I'll, and I'll leave some links in the show notes of this episode as well for anyone that wants to learn more about him. Because I think his going back to his personal branding, his insights, his agenda, they are so overpowering, overpowering and so exceptional that his inability to sell and his lack of charisma uh, become redundant because they're such powerful, <laughs> uh, powerful movers. And Tony, I've got one yeah. final question for you. So I'm going to ask everyone that comes on the show, 
And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Gee, it's a really interesting question because I, I wish I was the older version of myself <laughs> when I was younger. So I'd, I would just say, don't try so hard. It's, it, you know, the, the thing with selling is that we think we have to influence someone. We have to manipulate them. We've got to cause them to make a decision. To me, selling is about having a great work ethic and a great values and great values and find people that are a good fit. So you know, I've been in professional selling now for three decades. Um, I started in radio paging, if you can believe that, um, back in the days when mobile phones were just coming to market. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just worked harder than anybody else. But it's really a case of go and find people that are a good fit for what it is that you offer. And then you're closing them. You're asking them to take that next step and do business with you because it's genuinely the best thing for them as well. So have a really good work ethic, have a really good work ethic, but just relax, you know, tr trust the fact that you're looking for people that you can help. Would another way to frame that perhaps be rather than just to try so hard, would it be better to frame it perhaps as make it easy? Yeah. And don't, yeah. And don't push and don't, and don't push yourself and beat yourself up either. You know, selling, selling is a soul destroying tough profession. I've seen many people being that have been chewed up and spat out by it. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've got to be kind to yourself. You've got to nurture yourself. You've got to be a reader, but you've got to be a true believer in the value that, that you know, that you offer people both at a personal level and for the company that you work for. Um, it, it, a lot of people overlook that they go and chase the money, but be a real believer in the difference you're making in your customers' lives. And, and that gives you some purpose and meaning in what you're doing as well, not just something that makes money. Good stuff. Tony, for everyone who is intrigued, and we'll have to have you clearly back on the show to dive into uh, the in-between steps of what we talked about. <laughs> but for everyone who wants to know more in the meantime, where can we find out more about you? So there's three places to find me. You can find me in LinkedIn. So just search for Tony J. Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. You can find me at my personal website. Uh, it's my website for my public speaking business. So tonyhughes.com.au. And my sales methodology website is rsvpselling.com. Amazing stuff. We'll link to all of them in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.red. And with that, Tony, thank you for the conversation today. Thank you for your insights. And thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Will, thanks for inviting me. I'm a huge fan of what you do. Thank you. And there we have it, Tony. Thank you for coming on the show. Tony's actually booked in for another show before the show even aired. That's how much I want to speak to him again and dive into this further. If you haven't already, make sure you check out Marcus's show, which aired yesterday, all about masculine emotional intelligence. That was an interesting one, and it does have relevance to sales, I assure you. And with that all said, I'll speak with you all again tomorrow. <laughs>